Big money brings Sprint Car Racing's biggest stars to Jackson Motorplex. How is everybody doing? I'm Jay Elson, and this is Midco Motorsports. Well, this was supposed to be the year that the Jackson Nationals became one of the highest paying sprint car events in the world. Instead, the top prize was sliced from $100,000 to $30,000, meaning organizers would have to settle for having the richest event in the country to this point in 2020. That was good enough for those vying for the chance to be crowned the 42nd Jackson Nationals champion. The recap is this week's A feature. Rain got in the way Thursday, so that meant double the fun on Friday. Austin McCarl led the night's first feature to green, but defending Nationals champ Brad Sweet pounced early. Big Cat works around McCarl before the end of lap one, and he really started to get up and go from there. Meanwhile, a couple of regional guys enjoyed solid runs as well. T South Dakota's Matt Jewell piloted the 09 to the podium. His third place finish was a career best with the Outlaws, as was McCarl's runner up. But the World of Outlaws points leader, he wins a lot. This would be number five in the year for Sweet and his second at Jackson Motorplex. Sweet's work didn't end there as he would also be a factor in the nightcap, although it was Darren Pittman that surged to the front off the start. The 83 stayed there for the first nine laps, but that's where Logan Schuhart took over. The 1S sticks to the bottom and steals the point away from Pittman with 15 to go. Shortly thereafter, Pittman would find himself in a battle with Sweet for silver. Those two swapped the spot a couple of times before Pittman gained it for good. But those shark racing fellas really had it working. Jacob Allen was the night's hard charger after going from 21st to 9th, and Shuhart left everyone in the dust. He claimed his fourth win of the year by nearly five seconds over Pittman. So now we fast forward to Saturday. Brad Sweet certainly came in as one of the favorites. Donnie Schatz, the 2018 Jackson Nationals champ, usually a factor as well. And then there was Shuhart, who was hoping to capture his first crown jewel after finishing runner-up at both last year's Kings Royal and the Knoxville Nationals. One thing was for sure, there would be no shortage of fireworks in the night's 35-lap finale. Darren Pittman had the pole, but Shuhart wastes no time from his number two starting spot. The 1S shoots past the 83 to lead lap one. Shuhart's momentum slowed quickly, though, as Bill Baylog rolled to a stop on lap two. The 17B did recover nicely, but still finished 16th. As Shuhart reestablishes control of the restart, Sheldon Howdenshield overtakes Pittman for second and then starts to reel in the leader. He'd catch him at the start of lap 10. Howdenshield uses the middle to move into the lead, but he would not get the chance to pull away because a short time later, the red flag comes out for Parker Price Miller. The good news was the driver of the 14 machine was able to climb out of his car after a hard tumble in turn one. The ensuing restart would mark the beginning of a good duel for the lead between Howdenshield and Schuhart. Back and forth they went three times before Schuhart finally gained some separation. Later on, here comes Sweet. Big Cat wins his own battle with Howdenshield to take over the runner-up spot, and he would catch a break moments later. Brian Brown slows around turn four to bring out the caution, which is exactly what Sweet needed. And he almost makes the most of it on the restart, but Schuhart able to hold him off. Sweet back for more two circuits later, and while he got him briefly, Shuhart manages to answer right back. Sweet would stay snug with the 1S the rest of the way, but Shuhart was not about to let this one get away. Logan Shuhart holds on to win the 42nd Jackson Nationals 34 years after his grandfather Bobby Allen won the same event. Uh, I was challenged a few times by some good race cars and good race car drivers, and uh, we had some good little battles there, you know, swapping the lead with Sheldon Hottenshield, uh, Brad Sweet a few times there at the end. So uh, it's, you know, something you don't want to see when you're leading a race, especially a big one like this, but uh, you just got to try and keep your composure and, and 
pick your marks and uh, let them, you know, let yourself control the race and, and try to limit your mistakes. You know, be on that platform with my grandfather, you know, to have him here uh, working with, you know, working with us, my mentor, everybody, you know, the person that got me into sprint car racing, it's just awesome, you know, he's on a yellow flag uh, there in the infield giving me hand signals and uh, tell me where the fast line on the racetrack is and uh, it's just nothing more special than that. Well, he broke into racing at River City Speedway, but this East Grand Forks native is now turning wrenches for a team on one of the top sprint car circuits in the country. Brian Sean has that story next. Midco Motorsports on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Speedway. The All-Star Circuit of Champions Tour starts its toughest grind of the 2020 season on Friday night in Ohio with nine races scheduled at seven different tracks in a 10-day span. That puts a lot of pressure on crew members to keep the cars clean, fast, and ready from night to night. That includes one man from East Grand Forks, Minnesota, who started cutting his teeth as a mechanic in the region when he was just a teenager. Brian Sean has more in this week's Inside Track, presented by Dakota Speedway. For nearly a decade, East Grand Forks native Grant Boyum has enjoyed the challenge of tinkering on race cars. I've always wanted to win, that's why I'm here. That's why I've stuck around. If I didn't want to win, I'd probably be working on a normal job somewhere. He's now a mechanic and a crew member for Rudy Motorsports, his fifth year working on sprint cars full time. If you ask him, he said he don't care if he's just a truck driver, all he wants to do is win. So um, as long as we're, you know, supporting you know, good racing and uh, we can get up front and we can win a lot of races, he'll be happy. I mean, these guys put in so much work. People really don't understand the hours they put in to, to make this all happen. And it's so hard to find great guys. And, and Grant is one of the few great young men out there. But Boyum's long and unique journey started on one summer night when he was just 13 years old as he cautiously approached three-time Northern Outlaw Sprint Association champ, Chris Shearick. One night there's an outlaw show at Grand Forks, and uh, we're walking in, and I, I begged my dad to let me go in the pits. And he, I don't know how, but he let me go in there. And uh, walked up to them and told them I was hanging out in the pits for the night, and they let me hang out. They came up to our car and just said, hey, uh, you know, can I scrape some mud? We're like, yeah, we could always use a mud scraper. Uh, and, you know, and we, we kind of gave him the crap jobs. <laughs> we gave him the jobs uh, that we didn't really want to do, changing tires and, and doing tire prep like that. I literally didn't know anything about it besides they were awesome to watch and luckily they taught me a lot of the right things. So um, you kind of just, you start with one thing and then you beg for them to teach you another thing and then they, they teach you that and then you just keep going up from there. Throughout high school, Boyum continued to sharpen his skills on Sherrick's crew, but then decided to take the next step, working with Destiny Motorsports, getting more experience on the road. Then came another big opportunity. I would guess I would say my biggest job was uh, started in 2017, uh, racing with Aaron Reitzel for the last, I guess we raced together for two and a half years, and we raced a lot and won a lot and won all-star championship. A lot of hard work and a lot of learning things the hard way to uh, having success was definitely awesome. Now in his first year with Rudy in racing, Boyum has his sights set on helping this team contend for an all-star circuit of champions title. And so far, he likes what he sees. We're looking forward to the rest of the year for sure. I think we've, we've gotten faster. We've learned a lot so far this year already. If we just keep uh, progressing, I think we're gonna get our car good. He gets in a bad mood quickly if we're not fast, and I mean, it turns around quick when we are fast. So uh, it's good because that shows that there's passion, that he cares about it. We're lucky right now. We have one of the youngest teams out here. Um, they work well together. They love the sport. And yeah, it's you can buy any piece now, but it's finding the people to put it together to make it competitive. The grind of traveling from city to city and state to state is not an easy path for the 24-year-old. But the fire to compete continues to burn, despite all the challenges along the way. A lot of late nights, a lot of late night drives, a lot of late night car washes, a lot of leaving the racetrack disappointed that you didn't win. But uh, you know, the, the bad parts, you know, if you can get over those, you know, it's it's just I guess just the drive to win and, and 
be the best out here. You know, me, my brother, my mom and dad, you know, our race team, our family, that, that does mean a lot to us. You know, just seeing where he's come, you know, how far he's grown and how far he's going to grow. There's a handful of guys that are, are really hard to beat and on nights that you can beat those guys, you know, you feel like you, you accomplished something. Now, Rudine Racing already has nine podium finish this season with Eliason sitting second in the All-Star points. Well, the stakes were raised at Devil's Lake over the weekend. $2,000 up for grabs in the Golden Hammer Late Model Challenge. We'll show you the highlights when we come back. The long-awaited season opener for the Northern Late Model Racing Association proved to be a bittersweet affair. Well, the series kicked things off with a big money race at Devil's Lake. They had to do it without seven of their series regulars. With the Canadian border still closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, guys like Mike Balkin, Shane Edgington, and Bill Mooney were forced to monitor Saturday's Golden Hammer Classic from a distance. Of course, that also meant better odds for the 12 late models that were able to make the trek to Crary. The Pure Stocks led off the night with Crary native Dan Aaron setting the pace early on that inside line. Three laps in, Steven Richards takes a shot through the middle, but Aaron's able to ride it out around the top and keep the 43 in front. He would not be so fortunate later on, though. Points leader Joe Armstrong, who has dominated this class all year, drives the 1CJ past Aaron's on the inside, and he never looked back. Armstrong wins for the fourth time in seven starts. The late models rolled out next, 25 laps for a top prize of $2,000. And this was a two-horse race between front row starters Brad Sang and Dustin Strand. After staying pretty well side by side for the first few laps, the 12S finally gains the edge on the 71 and settles into the lead. Four trips later, Strand looking to answer, which he does just before the caution flag flies. Strand had the point for the Delaware restart, but he wouldn't keep it for long. One lap later, he slips a bit in turn two, and that was all the help Sang would need. The 12S regains the top spot there, and this time, it wouldn't let go. Brad Sang wins the second annual Golden Hammer Classic. The third race of the night featured the Minn Kota Lightning Sprints. After taking a DNF at Red River Valley Friday, Bryce Haugberg enjoyed a much better run Saturday as he showed the way for the first 13 laps. Unfortunately for him, that wasn't enough. Kelsey Peterson got the inside track with seven to go, and she was gone. Peterson comes from eighth to notch her fourth win of the year overall and third at Devil's Lake. Late models also headlined the show at I-90 Speedway on Saturday. We'll show you the highlights from Hartford after this. South Dakota native Gary Brown Jr. has picked up right where he left off after winning last year's Tri-State Late Models Championship. While Brown had yet to win in 2020, he was the only driver to finish in the top 10 of each of the series' first four races. After settling for fifth Friday at Rapid Speedway, Brown continued his search for that first checkered flag Saturday at I-90. To Hartford we go where the hobby stocks kick things off. Lots of movement in this one, beginning with a great run on the outside from number eight starter Levi Vanderwaddy. The eight car surges past pole setter Brian Campbell for the lead on lap three but everyone knew who was coming. Four laps later, USRA National Points leader Dustin Gulbranson completes his climb from 12th with an inside pass, and that was that. Vanderwaddy settled for third, while Gulbranson notched his third straight win at I-90. Moving ahead to the late model street stocks where Sioux Falls' Briley Goff had the 83X dialed in. Goff took full control on the opening lap, but Zach Olivier eventually makes things interesting. Olivier makes good use of a long green flag run to chase Goff down, ultimately overtaking him right at the line. But it would all be for naught as the caution flag cancels the pass. That was great news for Goff because he got his groove back after the restart and he ends up sailing to his first victory of 2020. Byberg's Brant O'Banion would fight for the lead with fellow front row starter Lincoln Drewis off the start of the 305 feature, and it's the 20 car that earns the early edge. 
O'Banion stayed aggressive from there. The leader weaves through traffic with ease to create a solid gap between him and the field. But after a late caution brought O'Banion back to the pack, Elliot Omdahl seizes the opportunity. He gets wheel to wheel with the 20 before pulling away as they come out of turn two. And that was the clincher. Omdahl comes from 10th to get his second win of the year. 21 late models lined up for the night's main event, and the first two in line traded a couple of shots early on. Sioux Falls native Jordan Hyman edges in front of Ben Schaller to lead lap one, but the Omaha driver had an answer. Schaller gets a great restart following the first caution, and Hyman couldn't hold him off. Schaller cruised from there. He gets his first tri-state win of the year, which included a $1,000 payday. The USMTS has still managed to thrill race fans across the country this season, despite the challenges that came with the coronavirus pandemic. We'll have more on that when Midco Motorsports rolls on. Midco Motorsports on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Speedway. And welcome back. Well, despite an up and down start to the racing season, the United States Modified Touring Series has been able to keep the show on the road. That included a tour of Iowa Raceways in mid-June, which is where our David Brown caught up with USMTS and USRA President Todd Staley. Pleased to be joined by the President of the United States Racing Association and the President of the United States Modified Touring Series, Todd Staley. You're a man of many hats. You promote a couple tracks here in Iowa as well, but let's go back to the very beginning because what got you interested in racing as a kid? What sort of sparked that fascination? Well, actually, I lived in, uh, I lived in Webster City, of course, and I lived right up by the Hamilton County Speedway. And uh, I used to go out there uh, every Saturday morning and help uh, water the racetrack. I was I rode on the back of the water truck and and uh, then I picked up the garbage on Sunday mornings and uh, then started cleaning the bathrooms and then he just eventually worked my way up and I think for the probably the first 15 years I don't know that I ever missed a race. A lot of different things that <laughs> you got involved in from an early age and we mentioned now you know president of the USRA, president of USMTS, promoter at a couple of tracks. How do you juggle all those different responsibilities. We have a lot of good help. Um, I mean, Bryce Hall runs our, our USRA for us. Um, and I think we currently have around 44 or 45 racetracks that we sanction throughout the central United States. My son, he runs the Mason City Motor Speedway Rhine. Uh, and uh, Brad and Sarah Ratcliffe run the Hamilton County Speedway for us when we're gone there. And then Janet and I, and uh, we're just always, always, <laughs> always seem to be busy. Uh, Sarah works in our office, Casey works in our office, and Jeff Nunn takes care of all of our media. Trevor and Darlow are our tech guys. I mean, we have about nine full-time employees now, so it's, uh, it's pretty crazy, but we got, it, once again, it's just having great help on, on board that, that makes it all possible. And some of that great help, as you mentioned, is from your immediate family, your wife, your kids. <laughs> they're, they're all involved in some way, shape, or form, so what's it like to not be the only racing fanatic in the family. You, you've got a whole whole group of them. It is. I mean, uh, of course, when I met my wife uh, way back in 1984, uh, she didn't even like racing. She didn't. She never even <laughs> went to the races. And and the first couple of times she went, she's like, I just don't understand why you would like something like this. And and then uh, after we were together four or five years, and then she finally is like, on a night off, she's like, Why don't we go to the races? And it's like, Whoa, my, have you changed? <laughs> but. Uh, no, it's, uh, it's been great. We've had our kids involved in, uh, um, since about 19, uh, about 2004, I think, is when Janet and I just kind of went all in on the USMTS series. And if we're going to do this, let's do it right. And she quit her job. She was a supervisor for Casey's, and, and uh, we just went after it. Obviously, this year presents a little more challenges than any other year with the COVID-19 pandemic. How have you been able to take on and, and honestly withstand all these challenges to, to go to all these races and put on all these shows? Yeah, it's been it's been really tough. It was just one of those things that, I mean, it came on and uh, we had had uh, five races down in Texas. Um, we lost our King of America race down in Humboldt, Kansas, which is one of our biggest races that we do. And that was that was a real bummer because that's one of our crown jewel events. Um, on the USRA side of it, it was very tough because people were buying their licenses um, and no, no racetracks were racing. So it was like there was zero amount of dollars coming into the company. And uh, thank God they uh, put together the, the payment per payroll protection. We didn't want to get rid of, we didn't want to lay off any of our employees or nothing. And we, and we kept everybody, 
kept everybody working and uh and now today uh everything's pretty much going strong again and just looking forward to see what the rest of the future hold or the rest of the year holds for sure and obviously with the USMTS coming here, you guys have been on a tour all week during Iowa or in Iowa rather for this middle part of June. What's it like to, to continue to, to go around Iowa and to continue putting on these shows for these fans? Oh, it's just it's just something that we really enjoy doing. I mean, I've been to over the years, I've been to a lot of different races, sprint cars, late models, modifieds, and, and we have we're, we're blessed to have the USMTS series. Um, I mean, these drivers every any given night, there's 15 to 20 drivers that can win the race and and 90 90 percent of the time the racing is just great um i mean they, they just they get after it they don't want to they don't want to get in line and follow each other i mean there are some racetracks that you just you can't help that but uh it's just great being able to be part of something that's uh that provides such great racing action well todd thank you very much for your time best of luck in all your future endeavors you bet thank you all right, that is our time for this week. For Brian, Sean, David Brown, our producer, Levi Vanderwaddy, and the rest of our crew, I'm Jay Elson. We'll see you back here next Wednesday night for another episode of Midco Motorsports. <laughs>